Hello and welcome to another episode of One on One. Our guest today is Toyin Lulu Gumadi. She's a human resource management specialist with two decades of experience cutting across the entire HR value chain. Toyin has worked with prestigious organizations including financial institutions, media, trading and oil and gas. But today, we're not focusing on Toy's career as an HR specialist, but on Precious Conceptions, an organization she started in the thick of her battle with infertility. Toy Lulu Gumade was trained at an ISO certified IVF center in Ahmedabad, India, as an infertility counselor and family burden specialist. She works full time as a family building consultant. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Toy. Thank you for Great having, having me here. here. Thank you. Okay, so you're a mother of two now. Yes. Twins. Yes. Can you tell us about that journey to having your children? Uh, that journey took 13 years. That's wow. why I, I heaved this eye. Mm. It took 13 years. I didn't realize it would take that long. I thought, yeah, I'll get married and then I get pregnant. And you know how, it's, how easy it seems to be. Mm. And initially I told my husband I wasn't ready to have children. Let's just wait for a year. Let's enjoy this thing called marriage and settle down and balance work and home and all that. And he was looking at me like, what's wrong with this girl? You know, and then we decided, okay, let's start trying. And it didn't happen. You know, so I thought, okay, let's give it some more some time. time. And we were counting two years, three years. By the time it was, by the time it was the second year, okay, so that first year that, that we said we wanted to stay off, we stayed off. And then we, we said we'll try. And then rather than get pregnant, I now had fibroids. Mm. So I thought, oh, so this thing is going to cause delay for me. Yeah. And then I went to the hospital and the doctor said it wasn't going to delay my getting pregnant, that they were not in any way hindering conception, that, yeah, keep trying. And then we kept trying and kept trying. The third year, the fourth year, the fifth year, it didn't happen. And by that time, I was getting worried. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Why is this not happening? And then the fibroids were getting bigger and they were getting nastier and we ha I had constant episodes of bleeding, you know. So by the time it was like year six of my battling the fibroids, I decided I was going to take them out. That maybe they were hindering. Maybe that's yeah. why I'm not pregnant, you know. And maybe the doctor was just trying to make deceive me or make me just relax and forget about the whole thing. And my husband initially didn't support surgery. He doesn't like hospitals for anything. And most of the doctor had said, it wasn't hindering conception, so he felt I was too anxious, you know. And, but when he saw how badly I was bleeding and the pain I was in constantly, mm. he agreed and said, okay, let's, let's take out these things. And I took out the fibroids. They were plenty. But immediately after the surgery, I felt something had gone wrong. Oh, wow. I just couldn't explain it. My body, my body just started misbehaving right from when I woke up after the surgery. My body started talking to me that something was wrong. I didn't understand. So when you say talking to you, what happened? What did you feel? Did you feel anything? Okay, so I used to be someone that could get hot so easily. I'll be sweating. Even when there's AC on, I'll be sweating, you know? And then all of a sudden, I started shivering. And I would tell people, please put off the fan, put off the, f even ordinary fan, I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate. So I was getting cold easily. And it was, there's something wrong with me, you know? And, and then, rather than get discharged from the hospital like five days after the surgery, um, I wasn't getting any better. So I stayed in the hospital for like 16 days, constantly on antibiotics. I was just unwell. And I got home, I felt, okay, I'll get better. I didn't, I was still unwell. Then later I, I overcame that episode and I was fine for like six weeks, eight weeks after the surgery. And then, Wahala started. Now, um, when I said Wahala started, um, I started having pains all over again. And then I started having discharges. Mm. So I was like, what's going on here? So I went back to the hospital. Doctor said, oh, there's an infection somewhere we have to treat. And that was how it began. So we started bouncing off from one infection to the other. And it became so, so, so severe that I had to wear sanitary towels for like one year. Wow. It was bad. I just kept wow. discharging. It was bad. So um, I was generally unwell after that surgery. And 
Then I had to pray because it was becoming too much for me to handle. I was getting cranky every day, you know, constantly wearing towels and all that. I was just getting cranky. And, you know, this discharge was getting smelly, you know, like rotten protein. Mm -hmm. um, I had to wear a lot of perfume. I couldn't, my social life was zero. So I was getting cranky and fed up and I was just crying all through. And then one day I was, I was in church and I, and I said, God, I have, I have used all sorts of medicines. I have done all sorts of things that I know I could do to stop this discharge. I don't know what is going on with my body. I was in church that day and my pastor came up the pulpit and he started talking about healing. If you're sick in your body and there's this thing you're battling and you want the church to stand with you in agreement, please come out. I was the first person. I jumped out because at that point I was just tired of it all. And he looked at me and said, what's the matter with you? Have you been to the hospital? I said, yes, they can't seem to get a hang of it. So the doctors didn't have anything to say? They, they just kept anything? loading me with antibiotics. I'll go on antibiotics, five days I'll be fine, and then the sixth day starts again. Mm. And it will go on like and on and on and on, like that, you know? So I, that was how he prayed with me. And a couple of days, three days later, I noticed, come, this discharge has stopped. And he, had sto he stopped just like that. And then I stopped taking those medications. I was well. But I still felt something, something was, was wrong. Up. After a while, maybe like a month or two, I went back to my normal self. Now, the discharge took, took like 14 months. So this, this took me like 16 months wow. post-surgery to get well. And then I started living my life again. I thought, OK, now that that episode is over, I'll get pregnant. And it never happened. So um, we now began all the um, necessary tests, check your blood levels, do a HSG, let us know what is wrong with you. Um, was it you and your husband going yes. for this test together? Yes. Okay. Um, initially, it was me. Now, because I was the one that presented with an issue with yeah, the fibroid. The so yeah. doctor wanted to check, okay, are you okay now? And, uh, you know, so we, we did all the blood tests and everything, and it came back fine. And... Then they went to him and they saw all sorts of, <laughs> you know, it was like a mess. It was like all hell was let loose against us. But it got to a point, the doctor looked at us and said, see, if you guys want to hasten this process, go for IVF. Mm. And we were like, IVF, at what age? And said, just go for IVF. It wasn't appealing to us, you know. We thought we were getting help, getting pregnant. Okay, just hold that. We'll go on a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue this um, the story. We'll just go on a quick break. When we come back, we'll still have Tony with us. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us on uh, One on One. We still have Miss um, Tony Lulu Gumade with us. So you were telling us about the journey and how the doctors yes. recommended um, IVF. Yes, to you. but we didn't. It, it didn't. It didn't appeal to us. Oh, okay. We felt it was drastic. And we decided, no, no IVF, and we'll keep trying. And so we kept trying for years, and nothing happened. And then in 2009, um, we met an Indian doctor through our family physician who took on our case. You know, we were chatting with him on, on email, and he wanted us to come to India. And he said I should send him some reports. And I had to go through some tests because of that. Incidentally, a friend of mine had also mentioned a Nigerian gynecologist. So I thought, OK, let's kill two birds with one stone. I ran all the tests, and I'll show the reports to, to, the, to both doctors. So I did the tests, and I went to the Nigerian doctor, and he told me, so you have severe damage in your womb. And I was like, what do you mean? You know, so he said, what happened to you? And I told him I had the surgery some years back. And he told me I had additions that oh, wow. were scars in, in the, the uterus. Surgery. Yes. And um, it, there was basically nothing they could do with my uterus except they released those additions. So I went in for another surgery, hoping they would release the additions. It didn't work. I went in for a second surgery, like three months in between. It didn't work. So after I had the second surgery, the doctor said, look, there's nothing we can do with your uterus. You need a surrogate mother. And I said, 
surrogate mother. Try IVF now. And the doctor was, no, IVF needs a viable uterus to work with, you know, for it, for it to be successful. And you don't have one. So get a surrogate mother. We will treat her. And if she gets pregnant, she will carry the baby to term and then hand over your child or children to you at birth. And I was looking at him like, am I in the movies? You know, is it me? This one is okay, talking Okay, but sorry to, to interrupt you. I want to yes. find out. So how does surrogacy work? They take your eggs and they implant it into another woman. Another so woman. they will okay. take my egg because I was still young enough to, to produce good eggs. Yes. At that time, I was 38. So they will take my eggs. They will take my husband's sperm, fertilize, and then form an embryo in the, okay. in the IVF lab and then transfer into another woman Almost who has so, been prepared okay. to receive the embryos. Okay. And I was looking at him like, I'm in a movie setting, you okay. know. So he said all of that. I begged him again. I said, no, I don't, I don't want surrogacy. I want to carry myself. Let's have another surgery. And he looked at me and he said, no, no, it's not going to help. It's going to be more invasive. But I still begged him. So he booked me in for a surgery. So my husband now said, let's even talk to this Indian doctor, whether there'll be something else Different. coming from him. And he said the same thing when we sent him the reports and all of that. He said, look, the best solution for you is surrogacy. Come over to India and then we'll treat you. If you still want surgery, we'll put you through surgery. That's not a problem. But what I'm looking at from your reports, it's surrogacy. So at that point, I started thinking about it. And I was like, the first surgery went bad. I've done two more surgeries after. And these doctors are both telling me the same, same thing. thing. Even maybe the cost, I should, you're yeah. spending so much money. So I thought, okay, maybe I should even think about this surrogacy thing. So I started researching. Um, I read up some not so good reports, some very nice reports, but there was nobody in the Nigerian space that I could latch onto and say, okay, this person had a good experience about surrogacy and then read up. There was nothing. Everything I read up was abroad foreigners, Hollywood celebrities, and all of that. So there was nobody, nobody at all in 2009 that I could reach out to as a Nigerian to say, guide me through the process. Uh, maybe if I had gone back to that hospital and asked them to counsel me or link me up with a family or something, maybe they would have done that, I don't know. But at that, at that point in time, it was my own reality yeah, that I was dealing sure. with. And I was going through all that mental cycle, trying to get myself to the okay. point where I would accept using a surrogate. Okay, so let, um, let me just interrupt you here. I just wanted to find out how the family members react to this. You know, it's one thing you and your husband are going through the journey together. They are in-laws, they're your own family members. How did they, you know, take the news? And not only just the news, this journey of, you know, mm. not having children for uh, quite for a while. Way. So yes. how, how was it? Was there any negative reactions, you know? From family members. Okay, I'm, I'm blessed because I, I've got good family members on both sides. My, my own side of the family, my husband's side of the family. Now they were worried, they were concerned, they offered suggestions, do this, do that. Um, at some point, one of my in-laws worked in an, IVF, in an IVF center in Lagos and she pushed and pushed for me to come and see her, her MD. And I just, it wasn't just appealing to me. I was like, let me try by myself now. Are you guys telling me I can't do this myself, you know. Um, but we didn't tell them about surrogacy that mm. time because we were still processing it ourselves. Okay. So the time we decided, okay, we'll go to India, and it was looking like the Indian doctor would ask us to use the surrogate mother, we told my family first. And my younger sister offered to be my surrogate. Okay. And I said, no, you just got married, barely a month or two, no. You can't do this for me. You need to settle down and think of your own, own family. So we discussed it with them. And then we discussed with my brother-in-law, my, my husband's elder brother. And they were like, look, if it's, if it's this that will get you what you want, that's fine by us. And they were very supportive. Okay. Um, let me just, uh, because of time, let's, yes. let's just fast forward to where you now actually did the surrogate. Did you do it here in Lagos no. or in Nigeria? So we went in to India? India. Okay. Now we went to India hoping for a medical miracle hoping we'll skip the surrogacy thing. And then we go to India, and the doctor checked me again and said, no, there's no point. Let's go no, ahead surrogacy. with surrogacy. And when it works, I'll take you back to the theater and see if I can repair anything. And so he got me a surrogate mother. We went through the first IVF cycle. It didn't work. 
So I was looking at him again. Now I've used the surrogate. It didn't work. But before we use the surrogate mother, I said he should assure me that my children will not look one bit like an Indian. And said no, because we are using your own eggs. They won't take any genetic matter from, from, the, Indian from the Indian lady. Okay, so after much persuasion, you know, I persuaded myself. I read up a lot about it. And I said, okay, let's do this. When that first cycle failed, I went back into the theater. We had like four and a half hour surgery trying to repair everything it was it was futile nothing worked so i knew for me surrogacy was the only option i had the other option would be adoption but i wanted now because the doctors had told me you still have chances of having your own biological children your eggs are good so i thought okay let me do surrogacy at least i'll have I'll, I'll have my own biological children and if i try and if it doesn't work then I can do oh, adoption. adoption. At that point, I, I wasn't bothered anymore whether the child was coming for me or not. Okay, we have to take another break. Sorry, so you just hold that thought right there. Okay, just uh, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll still continue this conversation. Stay with us. If you're just joining us, this is One on One, and my guest today is Ms. Toi Lulu Ogumadi. She was just sharing her story of how she had to do, go through the journey of surrogacy to have her children. So yet you went to India, you were worried yes. about, you know, your, your children having any Indian identities mm -hmm. or not, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my third IVF surrogacy cycle worked. Oh. And eight months down the line, we welcomed our twins, a girl and a boy who oh, look wow. exactly like me. Wow. And dad. My, my girl is my split. She you looks age. completely like me. Mm -hmm. So when they were born, I was like, ah, at last, you know, it had taken 13 years up until that time. And when they were born, I realized, yes, indeed, medical science has evolved. I mean, this is me donating my eggs, my husband donating his sperm, and an Indian woman carrying my embryos. And they didn't take anything from her, apart from food, shelter, um, warmth, and protection for the entire gestation period, you know, that they stayed in her womb. And they didn't take anything from her. They don't, they, they don't look a bit like her. Nobody, if, I, if, if they walk in now, and I tell you they were born by an Indian, you will say it's a lie. Wow. So I'll try to prove to you that I did surrogacy. You know, it's that real. And coming back to Nigeria, I've worked with several families. Precious Conceptions has 44 babies, plenty wow. on the way. Wow. A lot of them through surrogacy arrangements in Nigeria. Okay. A lot of them. All right, um, so I'd like to interrupt you a bit. So you've, you've traveled, you traveled to India, you had um, the surgeries. I need to also talk about the cost implications because I think a lot of people are worried about that. Not to yes. scare anybody, but to just let us see the reality. So in 2009, can you just tell us how much you spent and how much, or maybe just a general overview of how much it costs now in Nigeria? <laughs> because luckily we have precious conceptions in Nigeria now. Yes. How much? Um, for you to go through surrogacy in Nigeria with the treatment, for one successful cycle, you will have about 8.5 million naira. Wow. Okay. Payable installments. Okay, because IVF treatment, surrogacy, um, the surrogate mother's compensation and all of that, legal fees and all of that. And we pay, we ask um, families to pay up in installments, you know, with milestone markers. So you're not paying 8.5 all at once, you know. But it's expensive everywhere in the world because IVF is expensive everywhere in the world. And because of the reagents and the materials and, it's, and the technology and everything that they use. You know, um, their training is vigorous and all of that. Um, so it's expensive. And we're hoping that, I'm hoping that there will be situations where um, intending parents who cannot afford it will get some form of funding and support at some point in time. But you know, in my work with couples here, what strikes me is still the lack of awareness um, of options. Some people will tell you IVF, IVF. And then you tell them, and they keep trying and they keep failing, failing. because they have an issue with their uterus. And, they say, and you tell them, why not surrogacy? And they look at you like, what is this you're talking about? So when I came back in 2012, one of the things I started doing was to educate the public. I was constantly talking about Absolutely. my experience. I was constantly organizing seminars and workshops. And I have a, a WhatsApp chat group where, where I've reached like 300 families. Um, constantly talking about options that people can pursue when they are looking for children. And they tell me, you're assisting God. And I'm like, 
assisting God. Thank you for leading to my next question. So yes. my, my, my next question to you is about religion. Mm -hmm. And you know in this part of the world we're very religious. Very, so what yes. role, because you hear people talk about, oh, um, Sarah didn't need um, IVF, Sarah didn't need surrogacy and all of that. How have you been able to um, balance that, working with religion mm. and your advocacy? Mm. Surrogacy is of two types. Traditional surrogacy, gestational surrogacy, the type that I had. You'll find traditional surrogacy even in the Bible. You'll find sperm donation even in the Bible. So when I start to talk about people, I take them through that history and I cite examples for them. This is this, this is this, this is that. And they still look at me like, what is this woman talking about? Yeah, because about? they also have challenges with the churches they attend. So yeah. was your pastor, you know, he said, you said he prayed for you. Was your pastor supportive? He of was. The process? Yeah, before we went to India, we went to meet him. And we're still discussing. And, it's, and he looked at us and said, look, even if surrogacy is the option you're given, go ahead and embrace it. And I was like, why? I looked at my husband. We didn't tell this man we're faced with surrogacy. You know, and he said, "Go ahead," and he shared some scriptural truths with us. Can you share some you know? of those scriptural? Because um, even some of the scriptures you use to counsel your people, can you share like one or two? Okay, so one of them is what I told you that even traditional surrogacy dates as far back as Bible days. Yes, and there are several examples. Okay. You find some people who can't have children, like when 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 uh, women can't have children, they will say, "Oh, give me my handmaiden, give me my girl servant, and let them have children, and I'll take the children to be mine." You know. So there are examples of surrogacy in the Bible. We read also of Er and Onan, brothers, who, who died because um, it was the judgment of God on them, because they refused to give their late brother a seed. So in their custom, when a man dies without children, his younger brother will marry the widow, and the first child from that relationship will become the late brother's son. So I point out this truth to them in the Bible, and they look at the scripture with new eyes. And I said, look, my husband and I agreed we were going to do something that was legal, something that was medically, you know, um, um, medically okay to do. My husband didn't sleep with another woman. He didn't impregnate another woman. IVF bypasses sex. Do you understand me? So if there's a technology that bypasses sex, I don't know why you will say I'm committing adultery. We had an agreement, yes, and it's because I had a situation where I couldn't do it for myself, you know. So there are constant discussions back and forth, back and forth. I share my experiences with people, all the prayers I said, all the assurances that, that God gave me when I was going through this journey. I share with people and they look at me like, wow, so this is real. So there are options. And I tell people, if you can, if you can wear glasses in these days, if you can fly in aeroplanes, if you can use telephone and other devices. In the olden days, we used to go to Nitel office and queue because we want to talk to somebody in America. But now, no. you can talk to somebody in the US on right where we are. It's technology. Okay, so um, because of time, let's talk about what are the greatest misconceptions that people um, have. You talked about the challenges of counseling couples. Mm -hmm. but what are the greatest, uh, maybe share with us two or three misconceptions that people have about surrogacy? Um, okay. A lot of people still don't believe surrogacy is available in Nigeria. They think it's a foreign thing and that the people that go through surrogacy have to go abroad. No, surrogacy is available in Nigeria. I have managed end-to-end -end surrogacy in Nigeria. Okay. It's older than 15 years in Nigeria. People yeah. do it, they are quiet Two. about it. Another one is you are helping God because they say it's assisted conception. Now, anything that you get you get help to do it's assisted even if you are wearing braces or you're wearing denture or you are wearing a wig That's or it. anything is you know that that you're not doing by yourself is assisted it doesn't mean you're helping god it means you're helping yourself now some people have assisted conception treatments but they don't go for ivf they still get pregnant spontaneously so it's to help you get over a disability it's like wearing a prosthetic limb because you, you've been amputated, you know. So it's when, when you say assisted, it's because you can't do it by yourself and somebody is giving you medication or treatment so that your body can respond and you are able to do it. Okay. Um, I just want to find out from you, your, your foundation, because do you still do HR? How do you fund? How does Precious Conceptions receive um, funding? To okay, run so we're a business. Oh. 
it's it's not an it's not a foundation. An we are hoping we'll get there. Um, at the moment, I've stopped my HR and I'm, I'm facing Precious Conceptions fully. So it's a fully owned um, company that I run, and clients have to pay for services that we render. Oftentimes, when we talk about infertility, mm. I, I won't speak of the rest of the world, but in Nigeria, many people, women are the face of infertility. How do you, you know, change this perception and how do you help the men? Because there's sometimes that it's actually men that also, you know, have the um, mm. issues as well. How do mm. you um, help couples with this? Okay, infertility is a couple's thing. So we can't say it's just the woman. There's male factor infertility, there's female factor infertility. And surprisingly, they both have the same percentage of, of, of occurrence. So in some cases, it's the man. In some cases, it's the woman. In some cases, it's both of them. In some cases, you really can't explain what is going on here. So, but because um, traditionally, it's the woman that gets pregnant, and you, she's the one that you will see her belly shooting, and she's pregnant. People sort of look at the woman first and say, why is she not pregnant? You know, deliberately forgetting that she also has a man beside her who is also responsible for her predicament. Now, what we tell people is, let the man get tested first, if there's an issue of infertility. Now, infertility is suspected if you have tried to have intercourse unprotected for one year, and there's nothing. So if you live apart, and you only see your husband like once in a month, no doctor will take you seriously at first, unless you're like over 35 years old. You know, but when you're under 35 and you live with your husband and you have unprotected intercourse three times a, a week, you know, that frequently, and then you're not able to have a child in the space of one year, then we suspect infertility. And we send the man first to the laboratory to get investigated. Because you know what? Their own tests are cheaper. It is not invasive. You can get the results quickly. And then you know, okay, if it's a male factor infertility, then you can quickly eliminate it. You know, if it's a female factor infertility, it takes more time. You're prodding, it's invasive, the woman goes through all sorts of screening and all sorts of... But the man, is only for him to have a semen analysis. And if he's the one with the issue, then you send him in for blood tests and some more supervision and possibly place him on medication. Or you look at his report and say, hey, it is IVF that will work for you guys. So I always tell the men, get checked first, support your wives. If you're coming to my office for a consultation, you should come with your wife, you know? So I encourage them. And you know, you have a lot of good men out, out there now that are also getting aware and getting informed, you know, and they are supportive, you know? So I see a lot of supportive men, um, and, and I still see a lot of men that are still traditional in their thinking, in the sense that they push their wives forward, you know? But I'm sure it will get better as more awareness and more education, you know, is shared with the public here. Yeah. I'm right. sure we'll get better. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Okay, and that's all on one on one today. I'm sure you have been very enlightened about the story that Mrs. Tolu, um, Toyi Lulu Gumade has shared with us today. Join us again for another exciting episode of one on one. Thank you.